Right, before we get into the word, I want to just share something about the 40 days, just bring you up to speed with what's going. The, um, I want you to know that the whole congregation is going to be involved in this. Super kids, which are the preschool kids, the super church, those are the school going children, the super youth, which is the teens plus, the super adults, which is the 20 to 59s, and then the super duper adults, which is the 60s and over. And that counts us all in, even the church mouse. Okay, so um, we're all involved in this. And for those of you who didn't know that if you're 60 and over, you belong to the Super Duper Adult Club, it's um, good that you found out at last, right? Okay, where we are in this whole thing of getting ready is, um, you notice the red band which says we are here. We're basically in week five. And we are preparing to um, get all the hosts sorted out, the hosts, small group leaders. And how this is going to work, how you get allocated to a small group, is you will have the first choice. So on a Sunday, early in February, all those who have signed up to be small group leaders will be lined up at a table with a form in front of them, and you can look at them and say, well, okay, you're on, not on police file, I'll come to your group. Okay, and then you can sign up. Which means that immediately you can fit in with somebody you feel you can attach yourself to. So that's how we're going to do that. Because for us to play chess and put you into different blocks, hey, it doesn't work. Because then we get phone calls saying, can you put me in another group? I don't like so and so. You're supposed to love them. <laughs> that, that's just a commercial, right. And then so on the 19th of February, the 40 days kicks off with an explanation on the 19th of what all we're going to go through in the six weeks. And then we begin the week, the 26th of February. We begin with small groups and we're really into it then. Now, I just want to encourage you that uh, this whole thing of us doing it as a church is we trying to regroup after what COVID did to us. COVID split us up into individuals again. And so everyone's in their own little cocoon. And the 40 days is meant to get us to come out of our little uh, padded cells and to get into small groups and eventually, with all the small groups um, active, the whole church is actually lined up. Um, and there's power when God's people are of one mind. You just got to read the Acts of the Apostles, the opening uh, chapter, first two chapters, and you'll just know when the church is of one mind, God works. Right? Okay, so now... One of the most important things is that you need to have a workbook. And if you want to, well, you, you just got to. To make the best use of the program, you need this book. It has a daily exercise, daily study, which you do for 40 days, which is long enough to get you into the habit of doing new stuff. And so the workbook costs a hundred bucks, and my own feeling is this is not bad for a hundred bucks when you look at the price of books today. So um, once you're in a group and you look into your purse and you find out you've got more month than money, all right, then you can speak to your small group leader and ask them if... They can, you can be assisted to buy a book. So we might say to you, okay, give us five cents. And you can have a book. Now, I'm not saying we can do that with everyone. Some people, we say 500 rand, you can have a book. Okay. So um, please sign up uh, for the 40 days because we'd like, we've only ordered 100 books for ourselves and 50 books for... Um, 
Willow Hill Vineyard Church, they're joining with us in this. So our two churches, two sister churches are working together. Um, so I need to be able to order the next lot of books once we've got more than 100 people signed up. And I'm hoping that we have to order another 100 or something. Then if you want to lead or host a small group, please sign up today. Because I need to get all the small group leaders together to explain to them what I would like them to be doing. So that we're all doing the same thing. And we're getting the most out of the program. And then if you happen to have won the lotto and you would like to um, sponsor some books for those who can't afford them, um, you are most welcome to do that. All right? So that's all I want to share with you on the 40 days today. Every week we'll give you a little bit of an input. I hope that's helped you just a little bit. All right, two seconds for them to change the PowerPoint and we'll get into the sermon. This morning I, I want to really share a, a very simple teaching. Okay, this is not deep stuff. Okay, this is very simple, but it's a very important aspect on our life as believers. And we may find that when I share both challenges you and also encourages you to be more proactive in sharing the good news of Jesus with others. So the first section, there are two sections to this uh, teaching today. The first one is, I've titled it, From Devotions to Demonstration. And we start with examining the life of Jesus. Remember, he's our model. Everything that he did, we're expected to do, right? Okay, that's five of you. Hello? Yes, right. It is right. Okay. The particular truth that we're focusing on is why Jesus was so effective in ministry. Now, being self-focused, I believe, is one of the saddest realities of modern-day Christianity. Man, we are like ingrown toenails. We're painful. Um, you know, it's me and my and all the rest of it. And um, when it comes to devotional time, we normally spend time with God for our sake. Okay, we're not really focused on, on him so much. It's, it's me. God, I need some help. God, I need money. God, I need, I need, I need, I need, I need. Now, I want you to know as we kick off that Jesus never just spent time with Father for his own well-being. Did you hear what I just said? Okay. For Jesus, his devotions always led to demonstrations of healing, setting people free, and the proclamation of the good news, etc., etc. So let's go to the scriptures. Mark chapter 1, verse 29. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her hand, and helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. Roy, that's the way you treat your mother-in-law, right? <laughs> that evening after sunset... The people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him, and when they found him, they exclaimed, everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, let us go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so I can preach there also. 
That is why I came. He traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. Now, this text tells us that while Jesus was praying in this secluded uh, location, a crowd was beginning to gather at Simon's door. And they all wanted something from Jesus. They'd heard the reports from the night before how people were healed, demons cast out, etc., etc. And so there was a crowd gathering. They had an expectation that this holy man was going to do some great stuff again. They all just wanted something from Jesus, the miracle worker. Now Simon, to his horror, discovered that Jesus was no longer sleeping in his quarters. And so Simon and his companion set out frantically looking for Jesus. And I guess they were a little irritated. I mean, why didn't Jesus tell them he's going off to go and pray? I mean, he just left them. <laughs> so I think while they were <laughs> searching for him, they were a little bit cheesed off. You know, that he let the side down, left them with a problem. And eventually... They found Jesus. And they excitedly explained to him the serious situation back home. That the crowd was gathering and the people were, were just waiting in expectation. And then we find that the text tells us that Jesus was just unmoved by their expectation. And he simply told us, let's go somewhere, told them, let's go somewhere else to the nearby villages, so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. You see, the one thing about Jesus was that he never lived up to people's expectations. His focus was on his father and what his father had planned for him to do. It's so easy to respond to expectations and a little bit more difficult to, ex to respond to Father. And so we find in Jesus that he is stuck to his mission despite the pressure of some persons to sidetrack him. Because Jesus had to preach in other cities as well. So he couldn't stay with those clamoring after him. He had to fulfill his mission. And he could not be sidetracked. We, we need to just ask ourselves a question here. How often have we allowed ourselves to be sidetracked from what God is wanting in our lives? Because one little detour takes you off course. And you've only got to be one degree out if you leave here and you're going to land on the moon, if you're one degree out, I don't know what moon you're going to land on, but not the one you intended. So we have to be focused and on course. And also Jesus knew that everyone had to hear the gospel. It wasn't just for those that could get to him. He had to go where people were so that they could also hear. He had to give others the opportunity as well. And here I want to give us a check as well. Guys, it's brilliant that God has touched our lives and here we are as family together in one place, excited about the love and the presence of God. But I want to tell you that outside of these walls are people who are lost, who are imprisoned, who are desperately seeking for meaning to life. And we have it. Everyone needs to hear the gospel. And so he had to give more people the chance to be discipled so that more and more could hear and be reached. Now it's very interesting that the gospel writers all record that Jesus would slip away early in the morning while it was still, while it was still dark to a secluded and solitary place to spend time with Father God. And in, in his quiet time with Father, he was carefully listening 
to his heavenly father and he got his marching orders for the day and perhaps for the week and for the rest of his life. When we have a quiet time with God, those of us who accidentally do so, do we have at the top of our list, God, what are you wanting me to do today? Is that a question that you ask God, that you're ready to respond to? And so he might say to you, bake Alan a cake and take it to him. (laughs) And your response might be, you must be joking, God. He doesn't need any more cake. (laughs) Whatever it is that God wants us to do, we need to hear it. And so that must be on our list in a devotional time. But for most of us, the devotional time is near a little bit in the Word of God, maybe read through a scripture or two, uh, write down some notes about what we've been taught, and then we say, God, it's been good, thank you, very lekker. And then we sing a, a song, maybe, um, and then we say, okay, that was nice, I've got to go to work now, bye. Um, and we leave with our plans for the day, but not God's plans for us for the day. You get that one? You know, I'm just checking, eh? So, in his time of solitude and quietness, uh, his time of solitude and quietness, followed by intense ministry activity, became a regular pattern in the life of Jesus. So, if you were watching Jesus, making a film of his life, you would find out, boom, there he is, while it's still dark, on a mountaintop, praying. Comes back, and then things happen. Next day, on a mountaintop, comes back, the dead are raised. On a mountaintop, gets sent to a pool to go and heal one person. From devotions to demonstration. And then we just recap what we've gone through a couple of seconds ago that what he received in this quiet place was strong enough to resist the expectation of friends and family. So he was God-focused. And so Jesus demonstrates that sustainable public ministry is grounded in personal, private prayer. You want to have a great ministry? You've got to spend time with God, get his instructions and then you will have a great ministry. You're not going to have a great ministry if you plan it for yourself. It's going to be a hit and miss. And most of the time, it's misses. So, without our quiet place of solitary prayer... It's difficult for us to maintain our sanity while we seek to meet the real needs of our friends, family, and live in a rough and tumble society. A secluded location is a safe place. It's a place of refuge from the encroachment of the world. When you get together with God for that time, you're pushing the world away. And you're connecting with eternal time, which just is a great thing to take place in our lives. A secluded location is a place to receive healing from the brutality of the world. This life we're living in is is tough. And a lot of Christians are, you know, disappointed that we have trials and tribulations, but All you've got to do is read the book. Read Peter, read James, and you'll find out, hey, Christian, it's going to be tough. You're going to go through hard times. You will perhaps even be persecuted for your faith. Jesus had tough times. I mean, how many times didn't they want to kill him? Uh, 
Our secluded location at its most profound level is a place of rest and communion where the deepest parts of us, our innermost being, connect with the empowering grace and spirit of God. That's where we get re-energized, get strengthened, get direction. You hear the voice of God saying, well done, my good and faithful servant. And you say, huh? You're talking to me? Yep. <laughs> a secluded location is a place where we get re-energized for ministry. And so like Jesus, our secluded location is the center we, where we live out, that we live out of and return to over and over again for refreshing and direction from Father God so that we can reach out to others. Now, I just want to give you some examples. Notice that there were times when, after spending time with Father, Jesus was aware of power of the Holy Spirit being present in him to heal the sick. Let's give you the example. Luke 5, 16. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. And one day as he was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law who had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem were sitting there. And the power of the Lord was present for him to heal the sick. You know, sometimes we get this feeling that wherever Jesus went, it was just the same all the time. No, he went through times when certain things stood out like this. He became aware that the power to heal was present. And of course, healings took place. When the time came for Jesus to choose the 12 apostles, we're told that he spent the whole night in prayer. How many of you have tried a whole night in prayer? I don't see that hand, eh? No commitments today. I, I know why no one puts a hand up, because you're scared. I'm saying, right, Friday night's your night. <laughs> uh, yeah. In Luke chapter 6, verse 12, one of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them, whom he also designated apostles. So with Jesus' life, we see that he flowed from devotions to demonstrations. And that's the goal of our devotions as well. In John 5, 19, Jesus kind of reveals how he's living his life. He says, uh, he, Jesus gave him this answer. I tell you the truth, the son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his father doing because whatever the father does, the son also does. And so in his devotions, father revealed to Jesus his plan of action for the day. And so Jesus could focus on the Father's plans and not have to come up with his own plan. I really believe if we, if we got that right, our Christianity, our lifestyle will change. It'll change drastically. Life will become so exciting as a Christian that you will just bubble over all the time. And people will want to know what drug are you on? <laughs> because how can you be so happy? How can you be so excited when things are so tough? So I want to tell you that Jesus is calling us into action. To actively seek the kingdom of God in our lives. And Father is ready to reveal what he wants you and me to be involved in. You have to understand God longs for us to listen to what he wants us to do so that he can do that stuff through us so that we can be reassured of his love, his presence, his power, and whatever else. So he has a check out challenge. If our devotions do not lead us into ministry to others, then we are focused on self 
and not on the kingdom of God. There's only one time where Jesus gave his disciples the instruction to stay. Every other time it was go. He said, stay in Jerusalem till you receive the Holy Spirit and then you will be my witnesses. In other words, then you will really go. Every other time he addressed them, it was to go, not to stay. Okay, second part. Hope the first part helped you. And again, we look to Jesus because we've got to learn from him, right? And so Jesus says this. He says, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. Now, the good news, the Greek word means to announce good news. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to preach, etc., 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 Then we jump to Luke chapter 4, verse 43. But he said, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God. And the kingdom is the word basilea, which is God's kingdom and his rule and reign over creation, over everything. God's the ruler. Doesn't matter what it looks like. He reigns. And so he says, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to other towns also, because that is why I was sent. And so the kingdom refers to God's rule and reign and authority in the universe, the whole of creation, and in the lives of believers. And the kingdom of heaven and of God is the spiritual kingdom that is at hand. It's present right now and it can be experienced. God is here now. We can never be at a place where he isn't. You can't exclude God from any place. You know, just to be funny, you want to go and have a shower and you don't want God to see you naked, so you say, God, stay outside the bathroom. (laughs) What a chance you got. He's living in you. He's in the shower. (laughs) So wherever we are, God is with us. And he can be experienced right now. And the present kingdom is a spiritual, life-changing blessing as we come under the present rule of God. The kingdom is all about God's rule. And if we say we're children of the kingdom then we are God's children under his rule. What the king wants, the king gets. That's a basic rule in any kingdom. So we, as the messengers of the kingdom of God, have good news to share with the world. I mean, that's what Jesus said. He said, go, share the good news. And I'm going (laughs) to... I'm just going to share with you that sometimes we've forgotten that we are bearers of good news and we get sidelined into slightly incorrect communication. So, so let me just share with you the kind of wrong communication we get into. First thing, we're not selling fire insurance. So our message is not repent or burn in hell. Does that sound like a loving God? It's amazing how Christians can mess up the good news with some other stuff. Neither are we selling eternal life. You see, that's already packaged for everyone born on earth. Every one of us has eternal life, either in Jesus or away from God forever. But we have life after death. So we're not selling eternal life. It's not for us to do that. 
God's already prescribed that in our lives. Okay, now this is a nice one. We're also not selling local church, you know, Christian church membership. We, we're not um, putting a sign up there saying, come to our church. We are the best church in Centurion. Whew. What a lie that would be. This can never be the best church while I'm the senior pastor. <laughs> because I know I'm not perfect. And I also know you're not either. And so as an imperfect mess, we are not the best church in Centurion. But God loves us as we are. The Holy Spirit lives in us as we are and he's changing us and that's exciting. So maybe before I die, I'll change. <laughs> I tell you what I hope so. <laughs> right, nor are we selling private type religion. You know, there's some people out there are looking for me and God, you know, us together and no more. Christianity is a community faith. God brings us into his forever family. One for all and all for one. We're here together. And we don't just like one another, we love one another. By choice. That's the hard part, isn't it? You look at me and say, oh God, do you really mean I'm going to love him? And God says, what do you think? I love him. You better love him too. Boy, it's tough being a Christian, eh? <laughs> well, so that's the bad news that we sometimes you know, share. But what, what is the good news? Well, let me run through some of it. The first thing is God is a God of love, unconditional love. He loves people. He loves his creation. Unconditional love. I've got to share a testimony with you here quickly. I just got to remember, I've got to come back to this place. Let me get that testimony. <laughs> you can whistle with me for a little while. A pastor shared this, and um, I think this is, the, this shows the unconditional, incredible love of our God. A young man was asking a pastor a question. He said, if I become a Christian, do I have to stop smoking pot? The pastor answered back, no. The young man responded back, no, 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 pastor. You don't understand what I'm talking about. If I become a Christian, do I have to stop smoking mar marijuana? Marijuana. Yeah, I'm not in Mexico. How must I say that word? Marijuana, marijuana, hey, hey it's okay. I, I just call it weed. <laughs> the pastor again responded back, no. So the young man reached into his jacket pocket, pulled out a roll of weed in a paper towel. Looks at the pastor and says again, if I become a Christian, do I have to give this up? pastor responds again, no. The young man muttered, I don't understand. The pastor responded, you are right. You don't understand. Let me ask you a question. Do you have to get cleaned up to go and take a shower? <laughs> no. You take a shower and that cleans you up. The same with Jesus. You don't try to clean up your life to be a better person in order that you can be with Jesus. You just be with Jesus. You follow Jesus. If anything needs to be cleaned up in your life, the two of you will work it out. Yeah. Jesus will point out to you. And you will actually agree with him. And then you together will clean it up. Hey, that's good news, man. Uh, but you know, a lot of people haven't heard that kind of good news. They've been hearing things, well, you better get your life cleaned up so that you can get to know God. 
No, God cleans us out. And if we've got to be honest with one another, which one of us was perfect when we received Jesus into our life? I was perfect. I was a perfect mess. <laughs> the second wonderful thing is God sent Jesus into our world to reconcile us to God our Father. Jesus came to earth as God in man, died a gruesome death on a cross in our place so that we could be reconciled to the Father. He rose again, conquering sin and death. He now reigns in power with the Father in heaven. That's the good news. It's got nothing to do with fire insurance or anything else. And some more good news. God wants a relationship with us and draws us to himself by his Spirit. He's not an angry God wanting to push us away for any wrongdoing. And, and guys, that's what some people think. They think he's an old, grouchy, grandfather type with a whip in one hand and the whatever he's got in the other hand. And he just wants to get us. If we do something wrong, he wants, to, yeah, he wants to make us suffer. That's not God. How many of you as parents behave like that? No, you've let your kids live even if they didn't deserve it. <laughs> you've loved them. You've cared for them. I mean, you've, you, sometimes you've, you've, you've said to yourself, man, I brought you into the world. I wish I could take you out. Um, <laughs> but you never did it because love overcomes others' weaknesses. And then lastly, I just want to say this. God wants to walk with us as we travel through life on this planet, healing, restoring, energizing, guiding, supplying and providing and ministering to his people's spiritual, emotional and physical needs. That's the good news. We need to tell people God is for you. He's not against you. God loves you. He's not judging you. Don't try and get yourself cleaned up before he cleans you out. Because he does a much better job. You know, any cleaning up we do is kind of surface. <laughs> you know, we, we don't get to the root causes of all the junk. But the Holy Spirit can, you know, he gets in real deep. The bones, the muscles. And he cleans us out. And so the instruction to Jesus... Uh, the instruction of Jesus to his followers goes like this. As you go, preach the message. The kingdom of heaven is near. That's so important. Because people think God is up there somewhere. Way somewhere. And with all our wonderful satellites and rockets and whatever's gone out there into the, uh, the universe... They've just discovered he's even further away than they thought. <laughs> Jesus says, tell the people the kingdom of God is right here, right now. In Luke chapter 10 verse 9, he says, heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God is near you. These are the instructions of Jesus to his disciples. And so we need to proclaim, to share, to talk about the fact that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's why we pray the prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so we can ask for the miraculous. We can ask for disease to be taken away because in heaven there's no such thing as disease. God's kingdom is breaking in on this earth. So how is this kingdom here? Well, it's very simple. Very simple. We can experience an encounter with God. 
we can actually know a real, the reality of a relationship with Father God through Jesus Christ. You see, we haven't joined a religious club. We've come into a relationship with Father through Jesus. And we're his family. And then secondly, the kingdom of God is here, breaking in. Because we can receive power and authority. Remember the two legs on which we stand? Power and authority. To minister in his name. And all the gifts of the Holy Spirit is available to all of us. Now we're going to give some teaching soon to help people get out of a previous a set of understanding about spiritual gifts. Just going to say it again. That all the Holy Spirit gifts are available to each one of us because they are situational. Give you one example. Never say you have the gift of healing unless you were sick and somebody prayed for you and you got healed then you received a gift of healing, a gift. And that's what the gifts are. We are the channels through which the gifts affect the lives of others. And all the gifts are available to us so that we can do the work of Jesus on this planet. And so I just want to, with caution, say that um, we need to note that the message is a given message given by the Lord himself. The disciples were not to proclaim their own ideas or the ideas of others. They were to preach the message given by the Lord. What was the message? Tell them that the kingdom of heaven is near. That's the good news. God is ready to meet with you in the here and now because he loves you, he cares for you, he wants you to be in his family. You're precious to him. Oh, so your life is messed up. What's new? <laughs> God loves you as you are. And he knows what you can become in him. And so as with the disciples, we're not to preach our own thoughts and ideas, humanistic or man-centered beliefs, world religions or philosophies. We need to be very careful that what we say is the gospel, is actually the gospel. And if you want to know the good news that you need to share with people, just memorize Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. It's only three chapters. But it's a kind of a condensed um, teaching manual of what the disciples went out to teach because that's what Jesus taught them to teach. Do you remember what it was? Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. Now, if you all memorize that by next Sunday, boy, will I be so happy. <laughs> Just remember, we are agents of God with a good news message. And I want, I want you to understand something. God is working in everyone's life all the time. So you go to the shopping mall and you're standing in a queue. Do you know that all the people around you, God is working in their lives then? And he might just invite you to come and work with him. We say we, we have a God who is all over the place all the time. A God who knows everything there is to be known all the time. That makes him a God who is forever present and working. And we just need to get in line and next to what God is doing. And great blessings will flow. We're agents of the kingdom. Okay, 
So the key thing we grasp is that flowing out of our, from our devotions, we need to be involved in demonstrations of God's presence and power affecting the lives of others. I, I hope you caught that. That was point one. From devotions to demonstrations. If we have devotions, no demonstrations, something is missing. Got to go back to God and find out what you're doing wrong. And so, if we have a devotional time that does not lead to reaching out to the world, we're not imitating the example of Jesus, who is our mentor, and we are not listening to Father's instruction. We live in a world where people don't listen so well. I don't know if you're aware of that, because they're speaking too much. I mean, just give them a phone. They're not listening. <laughs> and sometimes we go before God in our quiet time and we, we open the book and, oh, that's good. You, oh, you're reading scripture. So good for you. That's why we're going to have the 40 days in the word because it's excellent for you. So you open the book and you sit and say, hmm, nice, yes, okay. Mm, I've got to love everybody. Mm. Oh, what about my boss? Do I have to love my boss? I'll have to think about that one today. No, no, the answer would be, Father, this person I'm supposed to, does that include my boss? And he says, yes. Oh, thank you. I'll do it. From devotion to demonstration, right? Tell somebody that. Okay, I want to end with a scripture. That from Paul, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1. Now let me remind you, dear brothers and sisters, of the good news I preached to you before. You welcomed it then, and you still stand for a minute. It is the good news that saves you if you continue to believe the message I told you. Unless, of course, you believe something that was never true in the first place. I passed on to you what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins, just as the scripture said. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scripture said. That's the good news. And that's the good news we share with everybody outside of these four walls, starting from right now after the next song. Look at somebody and smile and just say softly under your breath, I'm going to ignore that last bit. He wasn't talking to me, he was talking to you. <laughs> Let's stand. Father, you are a great God. The only God the only one true God. You're absolutely amazing. The way you love us kind of boggles our minds because we always wonder how can you love somebody like me? But you choose to do that because of your love for us. You created us to love us. And we thank you for that. Father, we bless you. Bless you that you are working in our lives every moment of the day, even when we're not aware of it. And you're drawing us closer and closer to yourself. And for that, we give thanks and praise. And thank you that you reminded us today that we are to hear from you what you want us to do so that we can do your will and promote your kingdom on this earth. So help us in the things that have hindered us, set us free from them, so that we can be more 
proactive and active in your kingdom. And we ask that in Jesus' name with gratitude. Amen. Amen.